Uh, I'm Bob Steers, and thank you all for being with us here this evening. Uh, as you obviously, if you didn't read the program, you got a flavor that uh, tonight is the first uh, luminary session where we have really no traditional property type leaders here. Uh, there are no uh, investment bankers, so it's not about traditional uh, real estate asset classes or transacting. Um, as, as we got a, a great flavor for just now, that uh, demographics, technology, cultural shifts is impacting more than just retail. The Amazon effect is well known on retail, uh, but technology, demographics, and various other factors are affecting every aspect of real estate. And it's critical to stay on top of that. So, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to, again, congratulate and thank uh, the panel for being with us. Matt, I'm not sure you knew even what you were asking them, but you did a good job. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so it, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce uh, the next panel. Uh, I'm going to uh, start uh, with our moderator, uh, Roger Orff. Uh, Roger is partner at Apollo Management International, responsible for their European real estate investment activities. Previously, Roger was responsible for Citigroup's global real estate investment activities and worked at Goldman Sachs. Roger earned a bachelor's degree, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa from Georgetown University and serves on the Board of Regents. And uh, I'm honored to, to introduce uh, Debbie, who's an old friend. Uh, you know, just to give you an idea of, of, um, of how archaic real estate used to be, back when we started our firm in the late 80s, early 90s, when the first healthcare REIT came public, healthcare property investors, the raging debate in the industry was, are healthcare properties actually real estate? And that debate really uh, raged for years. It took a long time to, uh, to uh, resolve. Uh, obviously, it is real estate. And, uh, you know, Debbie uh, is, has had a distinguished career uh, in the industry. She's chairman of the board and CEO of Ventas, an S&P 500 company, uh, a real estate investment trust that owns uh, over 1,200 uh, health care, life science, and senior living properties in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, Ventas is one of the major capital providers to the healthcare industry. Uh, Debbie is a recognized leader. She uh, set and uh, oversaw the strategy that has driven Ventas's market cap to over $27 billion. And uh, since the company went public, the uh, compound annual total shareholder return has exceeded 24% annually since the year 2000. And just uh, as uh, one additional comment, uh, uh, we asked Debbie to wear that ring on her hand that she can hardly pick up. It might up. be hard for you to see. <laughs> <laughs> you in the back. <laughs> Which, as part owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins, is a Stanley Cup, one of two Stanley Cup rings. Very good. Yay. <laughs> she wore it knowing that I'm a long-suffering Ranger fan and I will say the three million shares we sold last, uh, last quarter had nothing to do with you being in the playoffs <laughs> and us being out. So thank you for being here and take it away. Thank okay. you, Bob. Okay, um, thanks, Bob. Um, Debbie, I'm always interested in people's background and it sounds like you've had a most remar remarkable one coming from where you came from to uh, where you are today. And who most influenced you? in your early days? Definitely my parents. And what did they want you to be when you grew up? Well, <laughs> so, so the short form of the story is that I'm a working class girl from Pittsburgh. Right. And then so in many ways, I am, my story is completely unremarkable. Uh, and um, my grandparents came here from Lebanon and Italy like all great immigrants, to give their children a better life and their children's children a better life. And I followed that pattern and really am the American dream. Mm -hmm. And so my parents were first generation, didn't go to college, and 
uh, made sacrifices so that my sister and I could. Um, and they wanted me to be whatever, whatever I wanted to be. And they never pushed me to, to do anything, but encouraged me and supported me. Mm -hmm. And were and my father, who was a, um, defied his socioeconomic uh, stripes, really, by supporting his daughters, which mm -hmm. was unusual at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So very lucky in that way. So when you went to these prestigious institutions, Notre Dame, and then on the University of Chicago Law School, how, how did you afford to do that, given your dad and mom for relatively Great. modest Great. backgrounds? I, I say all the time, because my dad was a mailman when I was growing up, and he made $10,000 a year. And I thought that when I wrote my tax check this week earlier. <laughs> that <laughs> my dad made $10,000 a year. Um, my <laughs> so a, cu a, couple, a couple things happened. So my dad became a, 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 a small businessman. Um, my parents were really smart, and at one point, in my life, silver dollars were in circulation as a real currency. And my dad was always really good with numbers. And someone gave my mom a silver dollar that turned out to be worth $20. So my dad thought, wow, this is really interesting. And he had this facility with numbers. And so he realized which were the rare ones and everything. And he became a rare coin expert. And he kept working at the post office. And as he got better at it, he would go to the post office and get his paycheck in silver dollars. And he would come home, and we would put the silver dollars out on the table, mm. and we would look for the rare ones. Mm. And uh, he then started, by doing that, he then started making more at that than he was at the post office. And ultimately, he then quit the post office and opened a small coin shop in Pittsburgh, which is how he was able, and he always said the proudest day of his life was writing that first check at Notre Dame for me. But I will tell you, it's so interesting to me why my dad did that, but nobody else did, because everybody else could. Hmm. And I still think about that in terms of entrepreneurship and initiative. Um, why, when everyone could do that, why was he the only one who did that? And that's how I was able to go to college, really. Mm. <laughs> and I see you've melted down some of these silver dollars yeah. <laughs> and turned them into. <laughs> uh. So, on that, were you a sports fan when you were a kid? Did, oh, you, did, you, did you play sports? And, and that's where the Penguins. Well, everyone in Pittsburgh, Matt can attest, is a crazy sports fan. It's a huge unifying aspect right. of the city. It's. It's um, the city of champions, the Steelers, really. We didn't have a basketball team, but uh, we had the Steelers and the Pirates when I was growing up, and my parents were both big sports fans, and so we had a lot of activity around that. And the Penguins really didn't come along until later. But I have really good sports cred throughout my career at Notre Dame right. with the Bulls, right. with the Penguins. Right. Lots of great, fun right. stuff. Um, but. I have very few regrets, but one is I never got to play sports as a girl, even though I, I, was, uh, I was a pretty good little athlete, mm -hmm. and, but the opportunities were not available. And to be honest, it was more than just being a girl, but my school was really poor. We didn't even have a gym. So we did have a rinky-dink little you know, Catholic high school basketball team, mm -hmm. boys basketball team, but that was really mm -hmm. all that was available. So, I would have loved to have played team sports. Okay, and, and why law school versus business school? Uh, I wonder about that because <laughs> I think it's all I knew. I didn't, um, uh, I, I, I didn't really know business people when I decided to be a lawyer. Right. Um, I was 16 actually, and during Watergate decided that I thought it would be cool to be a journalist or a lawyer. Right. And so, because all the cool people in Watergate were journalists and lawyers. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and that was really why. And Those so, are the ones that didn't go to jail. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or maybe some of them did, actually, thinking about it. Exactly. So, um, uh, so that, was, I, that was really when I decided I might want to be a lawyer. But right. I really didn't understand or know the business world at all. And right. so... It was aspirational, so it was but 
law is going to do law. still within something right. I knew, yes. And do you find law just... Since, since I have the so-called JD MBA, was, was law, has law been helpful to your business career? Or in hindsight, would you say, well, actually it was, you know, it wasn't really as helpful as maybe getting a business degree would have been? Well, I think it's definitely been helpful, but it, it also has some disadvantages in being a business person, which you may agree with or, or disagree with. But um, I practiced law happily for 13 years. I was a um, and then I transitioned over into business in a, a very um, non-structured way, mm -hmm. a, a random kind of way. Um, and being a lawyer makes you perhaps more cautious. It makes you perhaps see two sides too much, want to do a little bit too much analysis, maybe thinking there's no clear right path. And being a business leader, you have to make decisions and lead, and you right. often have imperfect right. information. And so those can be counterintuitive. Right. And, and also, lawyers are not particularly good managers or mm -hmm. don't necessarily have good people skills. Mm -hmm. And in business, you have to have those things. Mm -hmm. So, But uh, it has helped me, especially because right. it has helped me a lot in a public company setting, in the healthcare, which is highly... Um, structured yeah. and, and regulated. We do really complex transactions. Right. And so that creativity, the, 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 the deal savvy, yeah. that has really helped a lot. And, and when you, so you clerked, which one is, is one of the most prestigious things a law student can do, and then work for a law firm. Why, why did you cross the transom and decide to go into business? Yep. So for those of you who are looking for a really structured career path, you should probably close your ears for this part. But um, I have always had a very opportunistic path. It has not been planned out at all. I never dreamed of being a CEO or a business person or anything. But when I was a lawyer, I really loved deals and I loved business and I was good with numbers following after my dad. And... Um, I represented Sam Zell and a lot of his companies as they were private and then came public. And with my clients who have become my good friends, uh, I was almost half a business person, half a lawyer for them. The, the, you know, the, the people who are now the CEOs of, who were at EOP, Equity Office, Equity Residential, and things like that. And my, the, the way I switched over was really by doing someone a favor. A mentor of mine called in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, it was after the workouts and before the IPOs. And uh, we weren't as busy. And they asked if I would do tax-exempt bonds for them. And I had zero negative interest in tax-exempt bonds. It is literally one of the most boring things in the world. Mm. But because I'm always wanting to learn something new and because I had loyalty to this individual, who was in the Sam Zell organization. I said, okay, I'll learn tax-exempt bonds. Next thing I knew, I had this cottage industry as a lawyer in tax-exempt bonds. I started representing banks. I met someone at an apartment company, a public company, that um, was known as the tax-exempt bond REIT. And I met him through, that, through this little cottage industry I had developed. And one day, he called me up and said, I'm changing out our president of our company and I want you to come join us as the president of the company and a member of the board. Mm. And that's how I became a business person. Although not until I first said no, of course I know nothing about that. And my good friend said, Debbie, you need to call those people back and tell them you can do this. And, and, that, and that's was it. your good friend your mentor or was that a different? It was person? a different person. Okay. I think it was, a, I was actually David Nethercutt and Richard okay. Kincaid. Okay. And they said, and I was their lawyer, and they said, right. Debbie, you can do this. This is a great opportunity. Just like you said, when luck is running by you, you better reach out and grab. That's, that was yeah. it. And what, just about mentors, because we're with an audience today that's, some of them are younger than me, not, not, not my, but, but just kidding. Um, <laughs> Can, can you just go into that? I mean, how important do you think is, that's been to twist and turns in your careers, just finding someone that was out there who was sprinkling a bit of holy water on what you were doing and yes. helping you and guiding you beyond your father? Well, who thank, you, thank, you for, thank you for asking me that. So there, there are two, two parts of this that I 
believe have been crucial to me and, st and still are. So one is mentors, and I've had many, and they have taken a huge interest in my career and have invested in me. I think, including Sam Zell, who has sprinkled mm. the holy yeah. water on me um, uh, many times. But um, I, I find it very odd and off-putting when people come and say, like, will you be my mentor? So I think of mentorship really as a two-way street where you are somehow finding people you respect, they respect you, you're going to add value to them in some way, you're going to be worthy, so to speak, of their time and interest because all of these people have a lot to do, a lot of demands on their time. So I've always felt um, when someone took an interest in me and invested in me that I owed them double, you know, that mm. I was going to prove that that their yep. time and, and attention were worth it. And I and there have been many people like that, including Doug Crocker, who offered me the, mm. the job I have now, right. that have been amazing. Right. Um, so you have this incredible full-time job. Yes. And you also have a family. I do. And um, uh, that I always find it remarkable in a way because there are kids involved and kids have certain demands and you're a mom. Yes. You're also, uh, you've got this completely separate life. And I'm just interested in understanding how you managed all this and did both so well. Uh, well, thank you. I don't know that I did them so well, yeah. but um, I certainly did my best. So uh, my, I have a tremendous work ethic, yeah. even to this day. I can outwork, I probably can outwork some of the youngins out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's a great, a great yep. Uh, yep. gift, honestly. And um, I've made a lot of sacrifices to have the kind of life that, yep. that I have. And uh, I have have had children. When I took my job at Ventas, I literally had to move away from my family for several years in order to, to take that job. And uh, I've had a lot of support and love from my immediate family. And as I said, I, I have done my very best. I think I haven't, I'm not going to maybe win the Mother of the Year Award every single year, <laughs> but I accept that, right. you know, as, right. a, as right. a part of life, and right. uh, it's worked out pretty well, and if not, there's enough money for a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I don't have a follow-up question. The wheels are turning. <laughs> um, so, Bob mentioned from the time you've gone public till today, you've grown at 24% a year, which sounds I incredible. Although, you know, I, I wanted to actually turn to mistakes you've made. Maybe you should have feel, you should have grown at 30% a year. But what what would you point to um, out there in? Let, let's just take Ventas. Okay. And so to say, okay, you've, you've had this remarkable run, um, uh, and yet I'm sure you think about things along the way, maybe strategically or otherwise, that you said, gee, I could have done this better in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Well, truth in advertising, we've given back some of the returns this year, and we can talk a little bit about the market maybe later, yeah. but um, made plenty of mistakes, clearly. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've really had to to train myself in is that you can make mistakes and be wildly successful. Because sort of when you have the kind of background I do and the temperament that I do, you think that you kind of have to be perfect. And one of the learnings that I, I try to give others is that sometimes you, know, you can be really excellent but perfection actually can get in the way of doing that. And I do talk to young women, young professional women, in part about that mm -hmm. as a concept. And we've made plenty of mistakes. I think we've gotten the big things right, whether mm -hmm. it was the financial crisis or the uh, seeing the vision of what 
healthcare, real estate, a trillion dollar market could be, the demographic trends, how to, how to grow the business from uh, really being in a corner. So we've gotten a lot of those things right. Um, the mistakes we've made have been uh, mostly of omission. So not doing things, not taking enough risk, uh, not doing deals perhaps that we should have done. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally doing a deal we shouldn't have done, mm -hmm. but at least uh, having underwritten it well enough that it's, it's, it's a protected downside. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've had some, some mishaps along the way in terms of our uh, we had our financial audits pulled one year, mm -hmm. and I, I think about what we could have done to have changed that. So certainly some bumps in the road. So, and when you move from the apartment REIT mm -hmm. to the healthcare REIT, did, yes. did you know anything about healthcare? Well, <laughs> that's a good, a good story. So my career is a series of doing things I know nothing about. Okay. Perfect. It really You've is. It I mean, well. it was the bonds. It was going to ambassador, be a president right. of a public company, and right. be on the board. And that turned out to be a complete and utter baptism by fire. It was really one of the most extremely difficult situations of my entire career. And then going to Ventas, Doug Crocker, who had been the CEO of Equity Residential, the largest multifamily REIT, called me and said, I have this great job for you. And he told me it was Ventas. And I said, thank you, Doug. I'll go do some work. I'll come back and talk to you. And I did some work. I came back and talked to him. And my words exactly were, first of all, this company is a dumpster fire, one. <laughs> <laughs> and two, um, it's a healthcare read. Don't you think you need someone who knows something about healthcare? <laughs> And I, I'll never forget, he said, Debbie, we need someone who knows REITs and real estate and public markets and workouts, because it was one, um, and the legal stuff, and we need someone with backbone. You'll, you'll be fine. So that was, that was how I took the job. And it turns out I did need to know something about healthcare. Right. <laughs> and so I learned it as fast as I could. And did people resent you when you turned up without having a background in healthcare? And now you're the boss, and there are other people who probably think they knew something about this. And how, how did you manage that? Did you did you fake it, or did did you did you actually tell them? Actually, I don't know anything, so please tell me what I don't know. Uh, I I tend to be more honest in that right. regard. But I did have that University of Chicago law right. school. Right. This is where it really helped yeah. me intellectual confidence yeah. that I could figure it out. If I just worked hard enough, studied enough, talked to enough people, I could figure out enough mm -hmm. to do a multi-billion dollar restructuring with the likes of David Tepper and all these other people, mm -hmm. the JP Morgans and Goldman's and everything. But I really needed to understand the business. And that was difficult, mm -hmm. but I just immersed myself. Mm -hmm. And I learned it. I learned enough to make decisions and save the company, basically. And being a REIT, is, is that the right place to be for what you do? There's no, do you ever think about, I don't know, whether going private or being a public company or being maybe a limited partnership? I don't know if there is such a thing as a master limited partnership that's not a REIT, and would that be uh, from a well, capital market perspective? Well, healthcare REITs have all kind of peculiar rules that don't apply to other REITs. Right. And that is very limiting if you're a creative deal doer and you mm -hmm. see different kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it has taught us to partner with others. It's taught us to be even more creative. <laughs> and we've also changed the law multiple times through private letter rulings because REITs are creatures of the tax code. So we've changed the law and the way it works. Mm -hmm. and. Um, um, to give us broader sets of tools to, to expand our business and do creative things. So it is restrictive in some respects. I do think all REITs, if there are certain, it, we, in terms of tax reform, if there had been certain changes in the way that real estate is taxed, there might have been less advantage of being in the REIT format. And so all of us maybe would have had to consider doing business in some other format. Um, 
So there are pros and cons, but for now, the idea of the migration of this $1 trillion of real estate that's in healthcare in the US that can be more efficiently owned by people like Ventas is a compelling opportunity. And it has served us well. As markets change, then I think you have to, you have to always recalibrate and reconsider what the best way of doing business right. is. And why did you expand into the UK? So you, you've got, you, you still have facilities there? We do. And we have um, we have a few hospitals right. there run by Spire. Right. And uh, we have some senior living there. Because like everything, we thought, we, 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 we do think there's a global opportunity. It's harder to make deals work in the current cost of capital environment, tax environment. But we wanted to have a pilot, mm -hmm. learn the business, and if it is, works and we know what we're doing, then we have a footprint to expand. It's small enough. If it doesn't work, we can pivot. Um, and that's that hedgy way that we've, we've expanded into a lot of different right. areas. And, and being a woman in the healthcare business, in the healthcare REIT business, has that been a help or a hindrance in, in your mind, or neutral? Is it? It's kind of all I know. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I, yeah. Okay. I'll just leave it at okay. that. <laughs> so, just turning to Obamacare, where I'm on a slippery okay. slope because I've lived That's in the okay. I've lived in the UK for uh, pre Obamacare and don't. But, but is it is that it for a headwind or a tailwind to to you and what you do? Well, we have over, when I started, we had all government reimbursed assets that were paid by Medicare and Medicaid. Now we have greatly diversified our business so that the vast majority of it is unaffected right. by healthcare policy in the United States, partly because healthcare policy in the United States is totally screwed up. And that was one reason we've changed our business model because mm -hmm. it's an unreliable, unlike, say, Canada or the UK where there's a much more consistent way of dealing with healthcare. The US is all, all over the map. And so we've expanded our business. So I would say in the parts of our business that remain Medicare or Medicaid based, which are limited, um, the Affordable Care Act, along with demographics, uh, is a tailwind because it increases the insured population. It um, reduces bad debt in hospitals, for example. It expands people who are working class, who can't afford health insurance. It gives them a way to have health insurance. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real positive, I think, both socially and in the business. Um, as the changes, as people are either trying to repeal it or pull parts of it out, like the individual mandate, which was repealed as part of the tax reform bill, it, it will become worse for the providers, the hospital companies and nursing home companies and others who are our customers mm -hmm. because there will be higher bad debt. There will be fewer people who will have health care. Mm -hmm. And that's generally worse for volumes and worse for the bottom line mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. But since we're a landlord, we're sort of insulated from that. And since a lot of our business is private pay, it were insulated entirely. And in would you rather be completely private pay if you had your druthers? You know, I believe in a diversified business model. Um, that is a, something that is often subject to challenge, and the academic data don't necessarily support it, and I know that. Uh, we like having reliable growing cash flow. I think we have been good at identifying businesses that have that. But no matter how good people loved senior housing two, three years ago, they wanted us all to be senior housing, and that's all private pay. But now senior housing is being overbuilt. So every asset class within the healthcare umbrella has pros and cons, and they have their day in the sun. And for us, who is trying to deliver these reliable growing cash flows of a large enterprise, $2 billion a year, paying a, you know, a billions in dividends, I like the idea of having the things that will offset each other because we know that they're not all winners all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we've approached the business. And, and the baby boomers like me that, that are sort of now in the 
in not quite the twilight or would like no like we're you're not you're quite young in the you're super young but but what so you have this big bubble of uh, dad came back from World War II uh, and you know had a bunch of kids and you know now we're all going to be popping off in the next 20 years does that what <laughs> what what, what I mean, does that worry you that I mean all your customers are going to be planted or, 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 <laughs> or I, I mean, or do you sort of say, well, then, then there's going to be the millennials and... No, no, no. So, so this, is a, this is a little bit of a misconception about our business. So the baby boomers are still, except in medical office, the baby boomers are still not our customers. So medical office, you know, the oldest baby boomers in the early 70s now, 65 is when you get Medicare you spend five times as much as younger people on healthcare, then you go to your medical office buildings, that's one of our largest asset classes. That's where we get the baby boomers, okay, in our business. The real customer for us in most of our business, not the University Life Science, but most of the senior living business is the oldest old, which is you are very far away from, but that is the fastest growing cohort in the US and in most of the developed economies, and that's this over 80 population. Right. Our average move-in age in senior housing is about 84. And so um, the over 80 population is 14% or was about 14, 15% of the population and it's going to probably just under 20% of the population. Okay. So that's our customer right now in the senior living and there are plenty of them and frankly this year is the nadir in births from the depression. And so this population is going to rapidly rise. Mm -hmm. um, when, once you start looking at 2020 and beyond, I, I really want to steal that term. There's, we're waiting for plenty in 20 because it, then it, it's like a rocket ship. Right. So um, can, can we turn to the capital structure side of yep. your business for a second? Yeah. You know, when I read um, the various things I, I do about interest rates, and no one really knows, of course, but people seem to think they're, they've absolutely bought them, which I guess they have, and they're going up, and I guess we'll find out with uh, the new Fed chairman how high and how quickly and how fast, and, you know, the 10 years bottomed at whatever, and now it's 280 and change, and maybe it's going to go to 350. And what I read says that that's bad for... REITs and utilities. So I'm uh, just interested in, there's nothing I guess you can do about it, but uh, I mean, do well, you think about that when you're sitting Absolutely. In I mean, we're a financial company. So at Ventas, we raise capital from the public markets and we invest capital. We provide capital to the leading healthcare and senior living companies in the US and to universities. And so that's how we make money. That's our business model. It's very much like a private equity firm uh, in, a public, in a public close. And so the capital structure and capital markets are extremely important to us and we are students of the markets. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would say the following. Um, uh, rates were 206 in September of 617. They are 292 today. Uh, REITs in general, as dividend payers, along with utilities and other dividend paying stocks, have been, are inversely correlated with rising rates, particularly around changing expectations in rates, which we've had. So the REITs have been down, um, I can just say for us, we've gone from 70 to 48 in that time period. I mean, it has been just brutal. But as Bob and I were talking about, you cannot fight the tape. This is the macro. Now, that having been said, we were ready for it. Very low leverage. We sold tons of assets in advance of this. We are still generating a great amount of NOI, as I talked about, you know, $2 billion of EBITDA. We um, fixed and extended a lot of our maturity profile in advance of this to protect ourselves from rising rates. We've hedged. So we've done, a, we, we, we didn't get out there with a, a big deal that we had to raise equity for because that would have been a 
bit catastrophic to have to dilute the shareholders by raising equity in this time of change. But what always happens, and I believe will happen again, is there will be a repricing of the underlying real estate. And I think this will affect the real estate market writ large. It's just that the public markets are more forward looking and they are affected first and they are more liquid. But ultimately the pricing on real estate assets will also be affected by this environment. And then we will, our cost of capital will get back in line and we will be able to invest again. In the meanwhile, there may be REITs that go private. It may be a period of time where there are more uh, private equity firms taking REITs private because mm -hmm. they're trading under the perceived value mm -hmm of the underlying assets. So it's a time of change and there's always change and you just, our job is to be ready for it and not allow our shareholders to be hurt by it. And during that period of time, position for the next change, which could be more opportunistic. That's well, how I think about it. And when you're saying pricing, real estate pricing, do you mean? Asset pricing. May go up because of inflation or may go down because the I, liability structures? I think it more, will probably go down. Okay. I think the REITs are often the forward looking. Yeah. And when you look at property pricing, underlying asset pricing, it's about double where it was in the, in the financial crisis, mm -hmm. but it's kind of leveled off. Mm -hmm. And it is a, as a cash flowing asset class. It is also can be inversely correlated to rates. However, in a growing economy that mitigates some of the downward pressure on okay. the valuation. That's how I think about it. I don't know. I have some experts in front of me right. who can well, correct well, me well, if I'm wrong. Let's see what, uh, well, we're not, in a few minutes we'll go to questions, maybe the, and maybe that will be one of them. Can, can, so you're chairman, you're CEO, you, you've created this remarkable run of growth. Uh, was it 24%, I mean, was it, was it sort of a straight line or there were, some, were there swings and roundabouts? And, when you started, did you ever imagine that 200 million would become 26 billion? I mean, no, I didn't. I was just trying to not. I was trying to have the company survive at the right. beginning. Definitely, never imagined. But and it was not a straight line. It never is a straight line. There's always setbacks and market changes and cycles and crises and all kinds of things. But the, the growth has been really extraordinary because we found ourselves, and you guys talked about it, in a sector that had tremendous opportunity that was completely untapped, that no one was really doing anything. And we had the vision and the passion, uh, not a lot of tools at that time, but a lot of grit and hard work, and we were able sort of to, to make something out of nothing and to convince the real estate people that this is a real asset class that is really a reliable cash flow growing opportunity that they should invest in. And in fact, I think Joe Harvey at Conan Steers invested at Ventas at three and a half dollars or something fun like that. And uh, the people- Give them a raise. Who, <laughs> the people who had that vision uh, really, and who took the time to do the work. And it's like data centers. I mean, uh, these are, I mean, tremendous asset classes. And I predicted, and I still predict, that healthcare could be the largest of the REIT sectors mm -hmm. over time. And, and is it correlated, when you, when you think about your growth, um, in, in I, I guess, defined by, maybe by revenues or per square feet or however you think about it, is that EBITDA. correlated, EBITDA correlated with, with states like fast growing states like i don't know florida and texas and california is that is that where it's mostly core it's correlated with organic growth from a combination of leases and um underlying like if we as if we owned hotels you know the ebitda mm -hmm. growth plus external growth plus balance sheet activity right so it's a, it's been a combination of those things plus improved valuation as people have come to realize that this is a must-own asset class, that it, it has reliable growing cash flow. So it's been a lot of things that mm -hmm. have enabled the, the growth. 
And turning to technology, which I'm always fascinated about as it relates to our business, which, of course, I know nothing about technology, but... but that makes two of us. When, when, <laughs> when, when you have to think about it at the board level or the strategy and look how it might be yes. impactful on what you're doing, are you seeing signs of that yet or not really? I, I would say we are partners in a, in a fund that deals only with technology related to seniors and healthcare. Right. And so we're learning kind of as, as a, an aside, not as a core part of our business, but we obviously think it's incredibly important and we want to be knowledgeable about what's going on. I would tell you that senior housing itself, which is a very large industry, is still in its infancy as far as technology goes. And it needs it. Needs it. it needs that investment. And it's everything from really understanding your customer to predictive analytics to safety measures. And this, really, this isn't in our industry yet. And it's really the operators, our customers, who have to bring that investment, although we can help, to their businesses. Um, and that is a huge opportunity for someone who mm -hmm. is able to do that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of upside there, but not yet. It's not here yet. OK. And then the final question I have is so you've had this remarkable uh, career at Ventas and before that at other August firms. That when, when the REIT analyst ask about succession, which you're too young to think about, but you know, if you really have to think about it, do you have, do you tell them, I've got Joe Blow in mind, or this lady's going to take over, or do you, can you not say that because it's, you're not allowed to say that, or how do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things in any leadership position is to have a great team. I mean, one of the reasons I'm all so jazzed up all the time is I love the people I work with. They're really extraordinary, and we really work as a team together for the shareholders, and it's super fun. I really love that. Um, I think of my job as a public company CEO to be able to develop those people so that the board would know that if I left, there would be at least one and hopefully more internal candidates so that if they wanted to go outside to find another, another CEO, that would be their prerogative, but the firm would not be left in the lurch. The firm would be well taken care of, that we would have capable people inside who could lead the firm on day one. And we have our, our head of HR here, and he works closely with me on matters that relate to my succession as well as the next level down. And we do spend a lot of time on that. Okay. Um, they probably shouldn't be measuring my office for drapes quite yet, as you point <laughs> out, but I would say that is a really important responsibility that we take seriously, and it's right for the shareholders to be focused on it. Right. Okay, I think we have time for a few questions. Yes. Um, got it here. So, okay, so I'm going to ask a question that's not serious at all, and then we'll follow it up with more questions. Okay. And, and I have one for Bob, or actually from Bob. But in the meantime, remember to tweet your questions to Steers Global, and I'll, I'll be able to pull those down. So the not serious one is, who's your favorite uh, uh, penguin and why? <laughs> How could it not be Sidney Crosby? <laughs> because he's the best player in the world. And he's a good guy. And he works. He's will and skill and effort that combine to be something brilliant most nights. So we like that. All right. Love it. Um, OK. So as a woman in a male-dominated industry, do you feel an obligation to help and hire other women? Uh, I definitely feel an obligation to give back to the schools and to pay forward, if you will. All the good deeds, all the good luck that I've had, I feel an intense obligation to give that forward to men and women and to be a good example to both. And uh, I, I try to do that every day. 
I have a question for you. Um, first of all, congratulations on your success. Uh, you, Thank you, Bob. You did take a uh, dumpster fire of a company <laughs> and, and make it a, an S&P 500 name. And I think the reason you've done that is, you know, you, you have the ability to see around corners, you, you think strategically. And I agree with everything that you've done to position the company for the headwinds that Roger touched on. My question is, and we talked a little bit about, we have some people here who have been public and are now private and really happy they're private. How are you able to sort of batten down the hatches and maybe wind down activity in preparation for the next opportunity as a public company? Most CEOs, of, particularly of the big cap names, uh, have pressure quarter to quarter. And you're obviously thinking strategically. What gives you the ability to do that? To do that? Thank you. I, I can't and don't, we can't and don't do it that perfectly because there is pressure to perform. And I do think that great companies can deliver short and long term results, and they have to do both to have the license to go on. Um, but risk management is an important part of the business. And Right before the financial crisis, literally, we had been in a complete go, 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 growth, growth, growth mode, tons of M&A. Um, and after we closed the Sunrise REIT deal, which was a big, big uh, takeover <coughs> battle, uh, cross-border, uh, topping bids, all kind of crazy stuff, it was in April of 07. And it was, it was when things seemed really good, but you could tell if you were watching that they weren't going to be good. And we literally stopped. We changed everything. We stopped buying. We started selling. We had been paying off secured debt. We started going back to the agencies to get debt. And we got ready for the financial crisis to protect the firm. And we kind of did an upside downside analysis, which is if, if things go bad, how much value will we preserve? And if we're wrong and things keep going well, you know, how much extra are we making if we just keep on the risk on, if you will? And the analysis would show that it was better to protect the firm. It is really hard to do within the company, I would say even more than with the shareholders, because you've built this machine to go buy things, people get jazzed up, you've been asking them to you know, run through walls to do all these acquisitions, and now you're saying, could you remember everything I told you, could you please do the opposite? And it is really hard on organizations. And even now, this environment is hard on organizations who um, have been used to doing something and doing it brilliantly, where you want to say, let's stop or let's, let's redirect. Not really stop, but let's redirect our resources to what we think are value creating activities. And it is a management challenge. It really is, even more so than a market challenge, because I do think the investors, by and large, understand what's going on and can, uh, can acknowledge that they think you're doing the right thing. So um, those are both difficult, I would say, internally and externally. But that is what we get paid for, right? All right, Debbie, I'll ask you my question then. So if you're, uh, you're you know, sort of transporting yourself back to your 18 to 22-year-old self, what do you wish somebody would have told you then that it took you a long time to figure out? <sighs> to... to um, probably to take more, to be willing to be more confident to take more risk. Okay. So I'll conclude with, why did you choose Notre Dame over Georgetown? <laughs> it had a better football team. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>